Hello friends, let's read a book together today. Today, we're going to read a book called Wangari's Trees of Peace. And before we begin, we're going to do the same things we always do to prepare our brain for reading. We're going to ask a good reader question that will help us connect to the story. We're going to talk about a word that will help us better understand this story. And we're going to talk about the genre of this book. Then we'll check in on the front cover and begin. Let's start with the good reader question. The good reader question today is, why are trees important? I notice on the front cover there's lots of trees, which tells me that's going to be an important part of this story. So it would be good for my brain to think about, what do I already know about trees and why trees are important? So my brain can think of several reasons why trees are important. One reason I know that trees are important is that on a hot day, if it's really hot outside and my body's feeling overheated, I can sit under a tree in the shade, and that will cool my body down and help keep it healthy. Why do you think trees are important? If you're able, talk to somebody near you about why you think trees are important. Great. No matter what reasons you came up with, it'll help your brain better connect to the characters in this story. Good readers always do that before we begin. We prepare to connect to the story by thinking about what we already know. The good reader word that will help you better understand this story is I say, you say, forester. Forester. Let's tap that on our nose. Ready, set, tap. Forester. Let's robot it. Ready, set, robot. Forester. Let's wizard it. Ready, set, wizard. Forester. Let's always count. Ready, set, count. Forester. How many parts to that word? Three parts to that word. Now, a forester is a word that we use to describe a scientist who is an expert at trees. We'd call that person a forester. And that word will appear in this story, so see if your brain can remember it. The last thing we're going to talk about before the front cover is this book's genre. The genre of this book is nonfiction, which means the author wrote it to tell us some information, to teach us some new and true things. Now, the uh, genre of this book, the kind of nonfiction it is, is a biography, which just means that the topic that the author is teaching us about is a real person who really lived. And the real person in this book, her name is Wangari Mathai. If we check out on the front cover, we can see an illustration of Wangari Mathai, and because she was real, my brain also knows some things about her identities. Now, Wangari Mathai's gender identity is a woman. Wangari Mathai's race identity is black. Her ancestor's identity is that her ancestors are from Kenya. And I can also tell one of her interests by looking at this front cover is that she's really interested in trees. That's why the illustrator drew a forest and her in the middle of it. So let's begin. Wangari's Trees of Peace by Jeanette Winter. Jeanette Winter was the author and the illustrator of this book, so she did the words and she made the art. She illustrated the pictures. Looks like she used art materials for that. As we read today, I'm going to keep practicing making those text-to-text -text connections that we've been doing um, for the past couple of weeks. Here we go. Wangari lives under an umbrella of green trees in the shadow of Mount Kenya in Africa. Now, right away, that makes me have two text-to-text -text connections. I can think of... William Kumquamba, and also Beatrice Bira, William Kumquamba from the book The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind, and Beatrice Bira from the book Beatrice's Goat, who also had ancestors in Africa. She watches the birds in the forest where she and her mother go to gather firewood for cooking. Now, I notice that there are lots of trees in these illustrations, and that trees seem to be really important to Wangari and her family. The author has given us some information about their class identity, that something they have to do is gather these resources, gather firewood every day, to be able to cook and keep their family healthy with food. Wangari helps harvest the sweet potatoes, the sugarcane, and the maize from the rich soil. Wangari shines in school, and when she grows tall, like the trees in the forest, she wins a scholarship to study in America. Having another text-to-text -text connection, again to Beatrice's goat, because I know that Beatrice Bira did the same thing. Got to go to school, worked really hard, learned a lot, and then went to study at college in America. Those things were the same for Wangari Mathai and Beatrice Bira. Six years later, her studies over, Wangari returns to her Kenya home and sees a change. What has happened, she wonders. Where are all of the trees? Wangari sees women bent from hauling firewood miles and miles from home. She sees barren land where no crops grow. And where are all the birds? I notice that all these women, they're in the blue, exhausted from having to carry firewood so far. I wonder where all the trees have gone. There used to be so many. Thousands of trees had been cut down to make room for buildings. 
where the trees went, but no one had planted new trees to take their place. Will all of Kenya become a desert, she wonders, as her tears fall? Now we know the trees have been cut down to make room for buildings. It feels like the people with more money and resources think that they're better than Wangari and her family who have less money and resources. They've taken something that was important to her family and not bothered to solve the problem that happened when those trees were gone. Wangari thinks about the barren land. Barren means that the land's not alive anymore. It's not growing. I can begin to replace some of the lost trees here in my own backyard, one tree at a time. She starts by planting nine seedlings. Watching the seedlings take root gives Wangari the idea to plant more, to start a farm for baby trees, a nursery. In an open space, she plants row after row of the tiny trees. See them here. Next, Wangari convinces the village women that planting trees is a good thing. She gives each one a seedling. Our lives will be better when we have trees again. You'll see, she says to them, we are planting the seeds of hope. Wangari really cares about trees, and also she cares about the women of her village. So she does something to change the world. She does something to solve this problem. The women spread out over the village, planting tiny seeds in long rows, like a green belt stretching over the land. The government men laugh. Women can't do this, they say. It takes trained foresters to plant trees. The women ignore the laughter, and they keep planting. Now, I hear the men here are telling an untrue story, the untrue story that Men and boys are better than women and girls and can do things they can't do just because of their gender. But the women are stopping that untrue story by ignoring it and continuing to do hard work. Wangari pays each woman a small amount of money for each seedling that's still alive after three months, their first earnings ever. I notice that not only are there going to be more trees now because of the way Wangari is solving this problem, but also that the women are making money. I wonder if that's going to help them and their families in other ways. Word travels like wind rustling through leaves about the green returning to Wangari's village. Soon, other women in other villages and towns and cities in Kenya are planting long rows of seedlings too. But the cutting also continues. Wangari stands tall as an oak to protect the old trees that have not yet been cut down. We need a park more than we need a tall office building, she says. So I notice that not only are Wangari and the women planting new trees, but also Wangari is protecting the old trees from being cut down. She knows that these trees matter. The government men disagree with her. Wangari blocks their way from cutting down the trees, so they hit her with clubs. They call her a troublemaker, and they put her in jail. And still, she stands tall. Right is right, she thinks to herself, even if you're alone. Wow. This page is kind of worrying to me. Now, I notice that there are some people who think they really believe that cutting the trees down and making those buildings is more important than keeping the trees, whereas Wangari and the other women really believe in not doing that. And these men, they didn't solve that problem in a peaceful way. They solved it by hurting someone. Feels like that only made the problem bigger. But Wangari is not alone. Talk of the trees spreads all over Africa, like ripples in Lake Victoria. More women hear the talk and plant even more seedlings in longer and longer rows. The seedlings take root and grow tall until there are 30 million trees where before there were none. The author and illustrator are telling us that other women are in solidarity with Wangari, even though she's no longer able to plant trees because of her time spent in jail. These women are continuing to do the hard work. The umbrella of green in Kenya returns. Whew. The illustrator has shown us two important things here. Not only are there lots of trees that have grown back in Wangari's village, but also that she's not in jail anymore. Women walk tall, their backs straight. For now, they can gather firewood closer to home. 
The land is no longer barren. Sweet potatoes, sugarcane, and maize grow again in the rich red earth. And the whole world hears of Wangari's trees and of her army of women who planted them. And if you were to climb to the very top of Mount Kenya today, you would see millions of trees growing below you and the green that Wangari brought back to Africa. That's the end, my friends. My good reader question today is this. My good reader question is, why did, why did the women continue to plant even after Wangari was in jail? Why did the women who were helping her continue to plant trees even after Wangari was in jail? Think about that for a minute. Knowing that a good reader answer will use evidence to support their answer. So it will sound like the women kept planting trees because, and I know that because the author wrote or the illustrator drew. Why did those women continue to plant trees even after Wangari was put in jail? Think about that. If you're able, pause this video and talk to someone near you about your answer. Great. I wonder what you talked about. For me, I know that the women kept planting trees even after Wangari got put in jail because it was important to them that trees come back. Not only so they could gather firewood closer to home, but also because they believed it was the right thing to do, that trees were more important than office buildings, and also because they made money for the trees that grew. So, and I know that because the illustrator showed me, the illustrator showed me the money on this page. And I know that because the illustrator showed us the trees came back on this page and that it was healthier for the women that the trees were back on that page. That's how I know that they planted, they kept planting trees because it was important to them to solve the problem and bring trees back close to their village. Now, the last thing we're going to do today is continue to work with Venn diagrams, which we've been working this week. Now, Venn diagrams require us to compare one text with another text. So to help us, we are thinking about text-to-text -text connections, ways in which stories are connected to each other and ways in which stories might be different from one another. So today, as I was reading, Wangari's Trees of Peace really made me think of the book Maya Angelou, which we'd also read in class. Wangari's Trees of Peace really made me think of the book Maya Angelou. So I set my Venn diagram up like this. As always, my Venn diagram has those two big circles that overlap each other because they create three spaces. One for one of the books, one for the other book, and one space for things that are true about both of the books, things that are the same. So the way I set mine up was... On this side is Maya Angelou, and so we'd write things that were true about Maya Angelou here. Wangari's Trees of Peace on this side, so we'd write things that were true about Wangari's Trees of Peace here. And then in the middle is where we put things that are true for both books. And, and for me, the thing that was true of both books was the way that women stood together in solidarity to make a change. I remember that when Wangari was in jail, the women she was collaborating with, continue to do the hard work of planting trees. And I remember that for Maya Angelou, for Maya Angelou, she went on marches with the people who she was working with. So the thing that was the same about both stories, and that was the same about both stories, is that they stood in solidarity with other women. They were... in solidarity. I think that's a long word. These were all basketball words, so I was dribbling them, but solidarity, you have to make the sound. Solidarity. I hear that final Y. They were in solidarity with is a basketball word. Other is a basketball word. Women. In. So that's my idea. You can read it with me if you want. Ready, set, read. They were in solidarity with other women. So that was something that was true for both books. Your job today is to use words or writing or draw a picture to come up with things that were different, things that were true for Maya Angelou and her heart and brain and the things that she did and experienced, and things that were only true for Wangari and her heart and brain and things that she felt and experienced. So remember, you can use words with your, you can use, um, you can talk about it, write it with words, or illustrate it with a picture to show your thinking. But your job today is to use a Venn diagram to show what's different about the story. Can't wait to hear what your brain comes up with.